Hey, welcome back to my shop. Um, you might notice this is the RF45 milling machine that I have for quite some time now, and this is the <laughs> this is the fine feed for the quill, which allows you to feed the quill rather precisely up and down by hand. What's not usual is um, this black button here. When I press it in. The quill feeds itself. It's almost like magic. Maybe black magic. Uh, if you want to see how I built this power feed, hang around for the next minutes and I will show you. Okay, you saw the intro on the quill feed and <laughs> now it's a step back in time and we're going to build the actual power feed. And for that, of course, we have to take apart this warm drive for the quill. Uh, first, we loosen the set screw and we pull off the hand wheel. This is not the original hand wheel. Um, this is an aftermarket one because it's, this one is way nicer than the original one. Nice aluminum cast, polished other than ever. Next, we take off the um, dial. This is also not the stock dial. I machined and engraved my own slightly nicer dial out of steel. And we have this retaining piece, uh, which is held in place with two screws, which are removed already. And then we have the shaft running in two ball bearings with the worm on the end, which spins this piece here you can engage with this knob to move the whole quill. This is just a, a conical clutch that's engaged with the screw. The two parts are pressed together and moved together. Doesn't matter right now. You saw the other video where I made this um, timing belt gear out of aluminum with the steel hub and the four key weights. This slips right over the warm gear shaft like this. And I have the small DC motor. Uh, please don't ask me where I got this. Um, I had this in my chunk box for years. Um, it's a 20 volt, 24 volt motor with a 50 to 1 uh, planetary gearbox in front. At, at 24 volts this outputs about 120 RPM. And I have a, I have a 19 teeth belt gear here and 60 uh, here. So that all will go together like this. The motor will drive the, the worm shaft via this belt, which I also had in my junk box. And this will spin and will turn this shaft. But the problem is this motor has a very high... You cannot spin the shaft by hand because of the high uh, gearing ratio in here. Um, this would be pretty much impossible to turn by hand. So we need a way to engage and disengage the coupling from the, from the skier to the shaft. And what I came up with is uh, with a sliding key. I'm going to, to drill, drill out the center of this shaft and then we'll have a keyway machined in here with a sliding key that we can pull in and out to engage and disengage the, Boom. so that's the complete shaft. Shaft, bearing, space of bearing, and the worm as a piece of the shaft. So that's what we're going to work on. It doesn't look too crusty at all. The worm is machined pretty nice in here. Um, yeah, it's not too bad. It doesn't look very, doesn't look super Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> Until you look at the bearing, it's a... a <laughs> you can't make this up. It's a CX 
YZY branded bearing. Okay, I got the worm shaft with the whole bearing assembly uh, up in the lathe and I couldn't get the worms through the spindle bore of my lathe as I only have a 20mm bore. So I clamped directly on the worm with some copper sheet to protect it from damaging and I supported the other end with the steady rest. And I still have the life center in place that I used to help me for setting up the steady rest. And I have a dial test indicator back here that shows me the run out on the shaft and I'm at two hundredths of a millimeter and that's perfectly fine for this application. I'm not going to bugger around with that. Um, I'm only going to put a bit of oil on the steady rest so we don't mar up the surface. Okay, we're drilling 5.5 millimeters. 55 millimeters deep running the fog buff surf to get some location on there and then we're going to open the hole up to 5.8 and then we're going to ream it Okay, that was the 5.5 millimeter drill and I need to get the fog buster a bit farther back because it interferes with my drill chuck. Now we follow up with a 5.8 millimeter drill. And a 6 millimeter reamer. Okay, um, we drilled out and reamed out the center of the shaft. And it's a good idea to set it down and go to the mill cutting the keyway. Okay, um, we drilled, drilled out the center now we're cutting the three millimeter keyway. I want the keyway to be three point something so um, I'm using a three millimeter end mill. I already centered on the shaft so it's just going to plunge down and take a full full depth cut at uh, 1600 RPM. This is a two fluid carbide M mill. Okay, I made a few parts off camera because they are awfully small and it's hard to film them anyway. Um, I met, made this small key out of brass, which is drilled and tapped with a 2mm thread down here. And I made this shaft, which is just a piece of 6mm uh, mild steel. Machined a 3mm keyway into the end of it and drilled and countersunk for this M2 screw that will hold this guy together. And the way this works, I have my keyway in the shaft and it's drilled from this side. And I drilled on the rear side an access hole and you will see in a second why I need that. You take the shaft, you insert the screw already. It goes in here. Then you push it down until you see the screw head through this access hole. Then you align it on top and take the small brass key, drop the key 
on the screw. Take a small flip screwdriver and screw it in place like this. And now we have a sliding key in our worm shaft. And the timing belt gear slips over the key. And now we can, now it's locked to the shaft by the key. And we can retract the key by pulling on this shaft. And now it's free to rotate. Of course, we need to secure it in um, an axial position still, but that's the, the rough principle how this coupling would work. And this is also the reason why I wanted to have four keyways in this gear, so I increase my chance of engaging the key to four times per revolution instead of one per revolution. So you don't have to wait as long until the keyway comes around. Okay, I mounted the worm shaft with the sliding key back on the machine and looking good. Now we need a way to mount the motor and I already came up with something. I took the piece of uh, aluminum tooling plate and I laid out the shape that we need. Um, it has this, this tapering shape with a radius on both ends. Um, one side will be bored to fit onto the casting here and the other side will be bored to accept the motor. And it will have a few bolt holes to bolt it to the casting and the motor to it. We will also machine in a recess here where we will press in a, a bronze ring because that's the surface where the, where the um, timing belt gear will run up against. I don't want to have. I don't want steel against aluminum. That's a very bad choice. So um, I will embed a ring of bronze in there. Okay, I already prepared the setup. Um, let's let's pull off the, the protective film on the side of the tooling blade. Normally, I can't stand this stuff. It's soft and yeah, doesn't machine very nice. Um, but that's all I had in 10 millimeter thickness. So first of all, let's let's ruin the nice surface finish on there. Get rid of any burrs. Drop it down on the parallel. So now I I, I cinch down one of the screws so I still can move the part on the table and now we need somehow to align it of course as it spans on on all surfaces we don't have a reference surface that we can use but i have a scribed center line and we will use that to align it okay i have a a sharpened carbide point in my drill chuck and i will just line it up by eye in the, with the center punch mark here. Then I will move over to the other center punch mark and check how much we're off. And <laughs> uh, you can't make this up. Um, first, ten first try perfectly on. We can clamp these guys down. Uh, yeah, as said, somebody even I sometimes even I get lucky. If the point wasn't lining up with the center punch mark on this side, I would have to tap the part slightly into the right direction to line it up. But just by eyeballing, <laughs> without doing anything, I got it pretty much perfect. So I don't need to do anything to it. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm not going to fiddle around with that. So I'm going to drill out both holes with the 18 millimeter annular cutter, just to give me a starting point. 
the upper one will be machined to 20 mm plus a few hundreds of a millimeter. And if you're curious, I'm using uh, denatured alcohol as a uh, as a coolant. The de denatured alcohol doesn't do anything particular for machining aluminum, except preventing the tool from getting a built-up edge. Built-up edge is when the aluminum gets soft and it welds itself to the um, to the cutting edges and. Uh, cutting oil or soluble cutting oil prevent that, of course, but it's messy. And in aluminum, the denatured alcohol works perfectly fine and it does exactly what you want. It gives you that little bit of unstictivity for the aluminum so it doesn't stick to, the, um, to your tool or the cutting edge. And the nice thing about the alcohol is, of course, that it's, it flashes off. Um, when I wait five minutes, the table of the machine will be dry again. And there will be no residue. If you do the same thing with uh, soluble oil, will, you will get the sticky residue in the machine table. Okay, I decided to use a 20 mm reamer because this is not a super high precision application. It's just uh, a register diameter for the motor, so a reamer will be good enough. And I think we got a rather nice finish in the bore. Yeah, I pre-drilled 18 millimeters and then I reamed it to 20 millimeters. That's a bit much of reaming allowance, but as said, this is aluminum. The, the reamer can take it easily. It's for sure oversized now, but as I said, this is not. It will just register the motor roughly in position. Here I'm drilling the hole pattern for the motor using the pitch pitch hole circuit function of the DRO. For counter boring I'm just using a 6mm end mill. Okay, what I don't like about these counter bores is the fact that they almost go into the center bore and left with this very thin layer of aluminum that already bent over slightly. Um, I'm going to open these slots up. This will look a lot, a lot more tidy than this thin layer of aluminum bent over. Looks ridiculous. Okay, in my mind that looks way nicer than the than before. Okay, drilling the two holes that mount this bracket to the casting on the milling machine. And counter boring. That's about that's a bit fast. There we go, and I think we can, oh, before we can take it off the machine, we have to machine the recess or the pocket for our bronze insert. Okay, I set up the boring head on me and I'm using the auto facing feet, that means uh, auto feet in diameter, 
to cut the recess I will go go down point uh, 0.75 millimeters each time and then I will feed out to my striped line or slightly shy of the striped line and in the end I will take a full cut on the diameter to clean it up. Okay, went down 0.75 millimeters, change the, the boring head to auto feed by doing some magical things. There we go. Uh, we are running at 300 RPM. Some alcohol. Doesn't hurt. And it helps if you have the machine in gear. I stopped slightly before my layout line. Now I disengaged the power feed and engaged the auto retract, the quick retract. There we go. Now it's back on center. We go down another 0.75 millimeters with 1.5. Fill up the alcohol. Okay, we're down to three millimeters. So for these last few cuts to finish the other diameter, I'm just feeding down with the quill. Set my depth stop, of course. And we get a quick caliber dimension, 29.66. Now we can get a proper reading with the inside mics. That's uh, 29.93, so seven hundredths of a millimeter to go. A uh, quick idiot check, just to mess, to not mess it up. That should be the last cut to get it to 30 millimeters. And you see how little mess I get with the with the denatured alcohol to clean the machine. It's practically uh, no mess at all. Getting a reliable internal measurement with these guys is uh, not as simple as it looks. Um, I think we are three hundredths of a millimeter off. Um, too small. I guarantee that we're oversized now. <laughs> it's always. Nope. We get zero here. That's pretty okay. You have to wiggle them slightly while using the ratchet, and then you can get somewhat reliable measurements. This is three. That's good. So I think we can take this down of the machine and do a test fit. Okay, I test fitted the gear assembly with the motor and the worm shaft back to the milling machine. And as you can see, it fits all together, obviously. Otherwise I wouldn't have shown it on camera. Um, and I can use the fine feed crank to move the head up and down as usual, or the quill up and down, that's the right term. I can also use the quill handle to go up and down, just as usual. I can have the motor running, nothing happens, I can still use the fine feet as usual by hand. There is still some stickivity in there that I have to sort out, but we'll get there. And when I push this shaft in, 
it auto feeds until I push it out. You can retract. Ah, there's still everything loose in there, so shaft moves actually, but you get the idea. That's quill power feed. And once we have a cover over the motor and a nice push button on here, it will look it won't look as cobbled together as it does right now, but it will work. And I already tried it for drilling and it works perfectly and I hope that it works for boring small diameters also very well. So disengage, retract. I can also have it power feeds down and then disengage the the fine feed completely for a quick retract and then just re-engage the fine feed. But I like it. Um, it seems to work quite well. I, I like the engagement of the um, of the belt gear here with this with the push pin. The motor is running at 16 volts right now. I, I'm, I have to get a 24 volt um, power supply for it and a PVM controller, of course, to get speed control. Right now, I'm controlling the speed via the voltage of my lab power supply. That's not a very good way to do it because you lose torque on the low end. Um, you will also notice that I don't have any way to. Um, to adjust the belt uh, tension. I did this on purpose because I, I just machined it to the exact uh, distance and I have the right belt tension <laughs> that way. I hope tolerances on these belts are not as horrible. Otherwise I have to uh, machine some, some slots in there to make it move a bit. But so far I'm quite happy. Um, seems to work and it has oh <laughs> I just wanted to say that there's no permanent modification to the machine but that's not right because I drilled and milled some features in the worm shaft of the uh, quill feet but um, I didn't do anything to the castings of the machine so yeah that's rather nice I wouldn't do this for a CNC conversation because uh, there is backlash in the belt there is backlash in the warm and there is backlash in the quill uh, in the rack and pinion there so for CNC that's not a good way to do it for CNC you want to move the whole head of the machine up and down okay um, we're back at machining stuff we still have the aluminum bracket with the rough bands on outside and I'm setting it up on the rotary table right now to cut the big radius here and the two um, angled surfaces. I have an aluminum, a sacrificial aluminum plate with a few uh, M5 threads in it and two of the holes actually lined up with the hole pattern in this uh, aluminum bracket. So I bolted it to the aluminum plate and I screwed the plate to my rotary table. and. I pretty much dialed it in to, to, to be on center. There are a few hundreds off, a few hundreds of a millimeter off, but in this case it's really not a problem at all.
Okay, that's good enough. I'm not going to cut the radius of the, this end radius perfectly tangential to the straight sections because um, lining that up on a rotary table is always a bit of a nightmare. Um, I machined the radius a bit bigger and let it fan out um, from the straight sections, not perfectly intersecting. Looks perfectly fine in the end, but it's not as critical to machine as if you would have uh, a tangential intersection here. If you know what I mean. <laughs> Okay, I just stepped over and rotated the, the rotary table, table itself until I cleaned up the whole side of the piece from the band start surface. Okay, this is a very rough way to machine parts on the rotary table just by eyeballing. Uh, but the results are pretty good and as you can see I get a nice crisp step from my radius to my straight sections and I didn't hurt either of the surfaces by running an end mill into it like it happens often when you do uh, when you want to machine a perfect tan tangent so now we can take this off the rotor off this um, sub plate center this side on the rotor table and machine this radius over here Okay, we're cutting the smaller of the two radii. There we go. Cleaned up the whole surface all around. Nice surface finish. And this part is done. Okay, I added the bronze insert into the aluminum. It's just a turned ring and it's pressed into the aluminum. It protrudes over the aluminum about five hundredths of a millimeter. And this is just to give the timing belt gear a good sliding, uh, good sliding mating surface. Uh, so far, everything works out perfectly fine. The the key engages the timing belt gear nice and easy, and everything's hunky dory. Um, I also found a knob that I can screw on the end of the push rod. That's my clutch engagement and disengagement. I'll chamfer the edges of this key so the engagement goes even better when the key and the key slot don't line up perfectly. I think the next part to make will be a housing for the belt drive here. And I think I'm going to use some PVC. I have a sheet of black 15mm PVC and I will use that to machine a cover with the same outer shape as this aluminum piece that fits over here. And, and I think I'm going to use the pantograph machine because I don't want to go through the hassle of recreating that shape on the rotary table again. Mm -hmm. 